to pick up today in 3-5. Yes, ma'am. Oh. We're going to pick up today in 3-5, kind of where we left off, because we kind of really concluded out 3-4, the last class period. And um, so we're going to pick up in 3-5, which is a little bit of change, but not much. Um, the, uh, the fun, the good and the bad are, are that um, we're, we're stepping away from equations of, of level of difficulty that we finished up with at the end of 3-4. But we're going to be doing something similar with inequalities, and then we'll build back up to something around that level. Um, don't let this stuff spook you. It's, um, it, it, if you can wrap your head around it, uh, early on, it will make uh, some things. Think, if you can not get panicked by it early on, uh, then the whole process will be a lot easier. And a lot of it is simply going to be notation. So just. Um, Kind of expect to learn some new symbols, some new ways of writing things, and uh, don't let it fool you into thinking it's anything more than it is, and it'll make life a whole lot easier. Um, I do not have your test grader from the last time because I am not a machine, and um, uh, so my plan is to be getting that back to you on Tuesday when um, we have no death tornadoes, when Troop County schools do not cancel. And um, hopefully we have no death tornadoes, right? And I can get some grading. Um, what's the next one? Yeah, I'm not sure. They close? No, you know they close. Oh, they close. The true candy schools are canceled tomorrow, also. Mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I work with the system. Okay. It just so happened I got called when I was walking out the door. Well, um, yeah, we should, I should have put the preschool this morning. You know that, that run, that sprint to get your kids ready when their lunch is packed? <laughs> and you're like, ha, ah, I'm five early. And then you pull up and you're like, I'm the only one here. What's going on? <laughs> yeah. and, and then you turn around and you're like, look. <laughs> Preschool's closed since the Troop K school are closed. Like, but I didn't see it on the news last night. And the kids are late. They're up. 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 They're yeah, I saw that on Facebook last night. They actually said that Mountle is the one that, whose blue that was on, so I'm not quite sure. Yeah, because there was a tornado that went just south of Murray, uh, Murray, of LaGrange. Um, Murray's my hometown, right? And, uh, and it went just south of LaGrange and almost kind of, it was just barely northeast heading. It was almost easterly. Oh, I work on West Point and he's doing anything to the school, and that's right there by Alabama. Yeah, and and, uh, and Lynette got hit hard, right? Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. So, uh, and that's like Lynette Valley and West Point. I mean, it's like they're probably the corner yeah. really offering me. It's I really stuff. can't afford to go ahead. I know we'll have to make that day. Plus, this was CRCT. Uh, all right. So three five big goals. We are going to learn to solve first degree inequalities. Which means we're going to have to talk about what inequalities are, right? Um, we're going to learn to write our solution in interval, in interval notation, or set builder notation. Okay, then we're going to learn to write our solution in two different types of notation. And then we're going to learn to graph the solution on a number line. We've already done some of this. Um, we've already dealt with number lines, so you should already be a little comfortable with that. But all we're going to do is graph an inequality solution on a number line. I think it'll make good sense. Um, at least, I hope so. Um, so let's talk about some symbols. Um, there are four main symbols that we use when we talk about inequalities. Um, and they're all referred to as inequalities because they relate the idea that the two terms, one before and one after, are not equal, right? They are unequal. Um, so this is the less than symbol. And we always talk about reading it left to right. So the term on the left is the one um, that we're orienting the inequality with respect to. So for instance, um, and in uh, one of my classes, I remember the teacher made the comment, the alligator mouth opens this way. So this is preserved on video for all time, right? Mm -hmm. You make an alligator chomp chomp. Okay. So um, A is less than B. Um, what we talk about this, uh, that means that the B is bigger than the A, and um, I always say it's A is less than B, or A less than B. However you want to word it, it just means that <coughs> the one to the left 
is less than the one to the right. Well, the only difference between this symbol and this symbol is that little bar underneath, right? And that just means that it's less than or equal to. And uh, or means that it could be either way, right? There's the possibility that it could be equal to the a could be equal to b, or the possibility that a is just strictly less than less than b. Either way. Well, um, it's written on the board, but we flip the signs, right? So now I'm orienting the discussion still towards the first term, but this time the alligator mouth opens this way, right? So A is the bigger number than B. It's the bigger quantity. And in this case, A is greater than or equal to B. I'm making some kind of discussion on the relationship. It could be equal, <coughs> but it might not be. All that is is that little bar. That's greater than or equal to. And in correspondence, less than or equal to. Now, just because we have an inequality, just because somebody writes an inequality, doesn't necessarily make it true. So you have to check to see that it's true. So 7 minus 19 less than 10. Is 7 minus 19 less than 10? What's 7 minus 19? Negative 20. Is negative 12 less than 10? Yes. Yes, it is. If you look at the number line, negative 12 is, is more left than positive 10, right? Negative 12 is to the left of positive 10. True. All right. Look at our next inequality. 3 plus 2 greater than 6. Is that true or false? Why? What's the problem? 5 is greater than 6? No way. In fact, we know that 5 is less than 6, right? So this is a false inequality. It's all good. That's right. We can't work on that. Hold on. Because <laughs> every time I hit that button, right, it's going to make that sound. Also preserved for all eternity. And mute. Great. Okay. And I'm waiting for that piece of software to open up so we can, uh, so I can know that it's been saved. Oh, here we go. I don't think it got saved. <coughs> Alright, so let me just do some rewriting really quickly for the point. like 5 is less than 6, or 10 is greater than negative 12, algebraic inequalities um, may not always be true as well, or maybe similar like it. Um, for example, x plus 3 is not always true, uh, greater than 5. x plus 3 greater than 5 is not always true, is it? Um, I could pick numbers so that for x, if I plug them in, x plus 3 is definitely less than 5, right? Making that expression completely false. So for instance, if I pick x equals 0, is that true or false? It's false, right? Because 3 is not greater than 5, is it? So this is a false statement. So the issue is, only when x attains certain values will an algebraic inequality be true. Is that a reasonable comment? There are only certain values so that this inequality, this algebraic inequality, is true. Well, give me an example of one that makes that in the inequality true. Three, right? Because three plus three is six, which is definitely greater than five. What's another one? What's another one? 
four, three thousand, thirteen, thirty-two, seven. Yeah, I mean, all these numbers greater than two, right? Does two do it? Two, two would make it equal. If I had greater than or equal to, that'd be okay, right? If I don't. I just have greater than. So basically, any number greater than two. Does two point one satisfy that inequality? Does 2.0000001 satisfy that inequality? Yes, anything greater than 2, right? But not 2 and under. Okay, um, so basically, you know, we said it. Anything at all greater than 2 is okay. Just not two and below. That's a big deal. <laughs> so far, is this making good sense? Yes. Yeah. All right. Um, now, uh, we already said. Good job. Okay. So here's the deal. We like to write, we don't, we don't like to write, let me say this, um, these less than a number things all the time. So what we've done in order to eliminate the overuse of any of these inequality signs, because it can get confusing, we've introduced two different notations that are really useful. Um, and we define them this way because it really separates the idea of what it is we're trying to do. One is set builder notation, the other is interval notation. Okay, now the first one, set builder. The reason it's called set builder is because in mathematical terms, whenever we do a set, we use the curly braces, right? Whenever we define a set of numbers, we use the curly braces. So uh, if I talk about the, the set of the integers from 1 to 10, I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, all in a set, and I have the curly braces around. The curly braces are just to define a set. Now, the reason we refer to it as set builder is because what I'm putting inside of the set notation is some kind of discussion that tells me how I'm building the set, right? All the elements that are in the set, how am I constructing this set? So for instance, so let's say my algebraic inequality is x less than 10. So 9, 0, negative 5 halves, anything less than 10, right? Well, if I want to talk about the set builder, I write this idea of x less than 10 inside the set, and the way I read this is, when I, when you see the x, the vertical bar, and then x less than 10. The way I translate this verbally is the set of all x's such that x is less than 10. That is the verbal translation. The set of all x's such that x is less than 10. Do you have a question? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, so I had the curly braces to, to say this is a set. And this x such that criterion um, helps me to define the set. Fair enough? Okay. This is like saying um, you've got on brown pants and you want to know what, and you want to find um, what's a good color that goes with brown pants? Beige, navy. Um, let's, go with, let's go with beige. So let's say you want to go into your closet and you want to find all of your beige shirts, right? It's the same discussion, like, I'm going to go to my shirt, into my closet, right? And I want to find all of my beige sh shirts as possibles, as possible as it go in my pants, right? This kind of similar that you're making a set if you pick out your pants and you want to match the shirt. Or if you, you know, pick out a shirt and want to match your pants. Um, well, all I'm doing here is I'm going into the set with a set of, with a criterion that defines the elements of the set. 
Fair enough? Well, same thing here. X greater than 1. The way I define this is set goal notation. Curly braces, X such that X greater than 1. And from here on out, basically I hope what we see is in set builder notation, I give you an inequality where it looks like it's curly braces, x vertical bar, and then whatever my inequality was. You believe it? So I've got x greater than negative 6. The way I talk about this in set builder notation is I say, well, this is curly brace. The set of all x's such that x is greater than or equal to negative 6. x less than or equal to 25. The set of all x's such that x is less than or equal to 25. The set building notation is my least favorite of the two, but um, it's probably <coughs> the most um, officious. Does that make sense? Like, it's the most clearly defined on what you're doing. And the only reason is because if I talk about it like this or with the interval notation, it's really easy to um, mess up brackets and such. And the set builder notation is very clear. Any questions on set builder notation so far? And hey, we're going to do examples, so don't worry about this. Okay? Um, I have a question. Ma'am. Sometimes you say, here's the final one, x less than 25. Sometimes you say x is less than 25. You say x less than 25, that makes me think it's a certain number less. When you say x is less than 25, that, that, that to me that means a lot more numbers. Okay. Hey, they're meant to be the same thing. I mean, the, uh, the statement several slides earlier, the, um, the official discussion is that it, the official phrase really is the set of all x is such that x is less than 25, right? But, um, or less than or equals 25 in this case. I'm probably just dropping off the is. So when you say x less, you don't mean that? You don't mean I don't mean 25 minus that? x, no ma'am. Okay. Sorry for that, if that's being confusing. My apologies. Thanks for bringing it up. Because it was probably um, confusing to somebody else too. All right. Well, let's tackle interval notation. My personal favorite, just because I think it's more succinct and it's easier to write. Now, this also mandates that we talk about what these symbols are. Does anybody know what that symbol is? Infinity. Is infinity a number? Infinity is not a number, right? It's a concept. Um, we treat it like a number because we give it a symbol, and so, uh, you know, because we are human and we are finite, right? We, can, we have a finite lifespan, we can do a finite number of things, we have to sleep, we have to eat. We have all these regimens that we have to follow. Uh, we, we're really not that free. Does that make sense? Like we have a lot of constrictions just because of our bodies. Um, so we, we kind of think about infinity as this finite number, but it's just really huge, right? It's this really big number that's way out there. But infinity is a concept, right, that is going on and on and on. Like you can never get close to it because it is continually going farther and farther. Is that something like the No. Nothing does um, Think about it like, you know when we talk about the number lines? Mm -hmm. Think about just heading off to the right mm -hmm. and keeping on going stop. and never stopping. Right? That's infinity, right? It's not a location, it's just a direction. Um, that should be like a, a lyric from some 1970s, you know, acid band or something. Um, same thing for negative infinity, right? I'm not, I, on the number line, I'm heading off to the left, I just keep on going. I never get to a spot, just keep on heading on out, right? And this is kind of a hard idea because we think about, I mean, if there's a number out there, I can quantify it, right? I mean, Let's pick the biggest number you know. I can still pick one bigger than it by adding one. But infinity is this concept that you have gotten massively huge, like incomprehensibly huge, or incomprehensibly negative. That's the idea that's in discussion. So when we talk about x less than 10, right, I want to talk about all the x's that are less than 10. All every one of them. So what my interval notation does, the comma kind of 
delineates a right hand and a left hand endpoint, right? Right hand, left hand. And my negative infinity just says I get all the ones this way, right? And positive 10 means I get all the way to 10. Now, here's where the notation can become a little bit of a mess. First off, this is always the left hand endpoint. This is always the right hand endpoint of the interval, okay? So for instance, I will never write parenthesis 10 comma negative infinity. Do you see what do you see what I'm saying? This? I'm talking about going from left to right, like how you read or how you I mean or how you read a book or anything else. And so it makes no sense for me to put 10 comma negative infinity. Fair enough? This is always the left, and this one's always the right. Now Notice that some of these I have square braces, some of these I have the parenthesis, right? Not only are the ones that are just infinite, but all the ones that are have a finite number, like 10 and 1, I have the parenthesis, right? But look at what I'm doing. I've got less than or equal to 25. Agreed? X is less than or equal to 25. Whenever I have less than or equal to 25, Notice that I have the square brace on the endpoint, right? And that means that I have the option to include 25 in that interval. <coughs> when I talk about all numbers less than 10, is 10 included in this, inter in this inequality? No, but anything less than 10 is, right? So when I have the strict inequality, I have the parenthesis versus the square brace. Okay, so when it has the greater than or equal to sign, uh -huh, like you negative use that, six. that bracket for the on the end part. But if it's less than or equal to, then the bracket is on the right. That little. Um. Yes, it's which. I mean, basically, if I'm greater than or equal to negative six, right? Mm -hmm. Negative six is my bottom value in the interval that I can be. Okay. So that's why I start talking about from the left and moving right. Yeah. And that's what the that greater than or equal to is why I included the square brace. Okay. I have x greater than 1. 1 is the bottom value, right? But 1 is not included. It's just kind of like a lower <coughs> bound. So anything greater than 1 uh, is in that interval. And so because it's not including when I use the parenthesis. So what did I say right before we started? I said we're going to have to learn some new notation, right? Don't let it fluster you. Just look at it and try to pick it up, okay? It'll come. Yes, ma'am? So with the six, you can't use the six? Um, it's greater than or equal to negative six, right? So I can use the negative six. That's why I get the square brace. X greater than one, I cannot include one in that interval, and that's why I use the parenthesis, right? Same way here, I can't include 10, so it's my, my right hand endpoint, and that's why I don't include it. I use the parenthesis. So, what about the braces? You know, that yeah, if I have greater than or equal to, square brace. Strictly greater than, parenthesis. Is it strictly less, the same parentheses? Um, strictly less than is I mean, square brace, right? I mean, the regular, the yes, one. Strictly one. X greater than parentheses. Say again. It's strictly less. If it's less than, we use regular parentheses. Okay. And, and, and notice, everywhere I have infinity has got the parentheses, right? Can I ever attain the value infinity? No. I can never attain infinity. And so everywhere I have a negative infinity or a positive infinity, they get parentheses. Does that make sense? Because I cannot attain it. So in order to hold x less than 10 true, I have to pick up all the values of x where they're less than 10, right? But I can't include 10 because 10 is not less than 10, right? It's just less than or equal to 10. But I can't include that in discussion, so I have the parenthesis. This will all start to make sense in a little bit, I promise. Okay? <coughs> Now, one more thing. So, 
The, uh, the last bit of discussion here is the graphical one, and this will probably help as much as anything. Let's graph it on a number one, okay? I've got a number one. Here's 10. Now, when we talk about something being less than 10, is it to the right of 10 on the number one or to the left? To the left. Do I include 10 if it's less than 10? No. Here's how we do this. We typically do draw a number line with the number in question, right? And then we draw an open circle and so say we're not including 10. And we draw an arrow that kind of tells us that our solution goes, includes all those numbers to the left. Okay? Now, if you're not getting it yet, let's do the next one. Do I include 1 in this inequality? x greater than 1? Do I include 1? No. All the x is greater than 1. Is that to the right of 1 or to the left of 1? To the right. All right. So there's 1. Agreed? I would draw this one open circle. And then I go to the right. Um, it, it, it's the expression of the same answer, but not always. Well, I'll leave it up to you and how you express it, right? There will be times where I say, express your solution in interval rotation. Or solve the, solve the linear inequality and express the solution on a number one, right? All right, now, so I made a big old deal about if I don't include the number, right? Like, I didn't include 10, so I left a circle, open circle. So what happens if I do include the number? Like, x greater than or equal to z, x is greater than or equal to negative 6. What's that? I color it in. Yeah. And let me draw on this side now. Here's negative 6, right? Now, That's how I express my solution. I mean, the graphic one, I think, makes a lot of sense, right? You just have to find a way to correlate them all in your head. Let's do one more. x less than or equal to 25. At 25, do I have an open circle or a filled in circle? Filled in. And I've got x less than or equal to 25. Do I go to the right or the left? Left. Now, here's another way to think about it. I went to the right for this one, right? All the way to the right. I'm going to infinity, aren't I? Does that make sense? OK, now let's tie something else together. Everywhere that I draw an open circle, like for 10, I don't include 10, right? So I have the parenthesis. Everywhere that I have the closed-in circle, I have the bracket. That's, that's how we correlate them, right? If I include negative 6, I fill in my circle, and in interval notation, I use the square brace. Can you just say, follow where the goes to, or what's that? So we do I'm really not entirely still certain what it is you're at. I mean, like the like for um, Absolutely. Um, absolutely. Um, there, 
there are a handful of ways that we all think about this, right? Some people will think about the graph and then be able to, to correlate their understanding of the interval notation or set builder notation. Some will think about interval notation first and then build the graph off of it. Does it matter to me how you think about it? No, as long as you get it, right? Um, the reason I'm presenting them all three together is so later on you're not trying to correlate them, but now you can compare all three in a list. Fair enough? My personal favorite, that I love interval notation. Because I feel like writing this x such that x stuff is redundant, right? Um, it's like the office of redundancy office. Um, it's just a lot of x discussions. And I like this because this tells me everything I need to know, right? How long headed do I include it or not with the square braces and the parentheses? I like it. It doesn't make it perfect, right? It doesn't make it the best one. Um, I think the number line, the graph, is probably the most telling. And it's just because it, it helps you to visualize, right? It draws a picture, gives this, this visual relationship for our inequality. What do you think? Any questions? It's not math if there aren't lots of properties. Um, so here's some properties. Let's just give it a little bit. Now, what I want you to see is that they're not different from anything you've done before. With the qualities, if I do something to the left-hand side, what do I have to do? I've got to do the same thing to the right-hand side, right? Remember we said if we've got A equals B and we add C to the left-hand side, to retain, I've got to add it to the right-hand side. Holy cow, look at my inequalities. It's the same discussion, right? Um, a is greater than is greater than B if and only if A plus C is greater than B plus C. So by this I say if A is greater than B, then A plus C is greater than B plus C. And that's going to come in handy in a little bit. The same for subtractions. And vice versa. If A plus C is greater than B plus C, then A is greater than B. Um, have we talked about if and only if before? If and only if is a two-way conditional. This says if this, then this. And then reverse. If this, then this. Now, my dad used if and only if, meaning this very strict, serious, bizarre, you know, set of consequences, you know, set of events happens, then you can do it, right? Like, hey, dad, can I go watch this concert? Well, if you do this, if, you know, if and only if you do this, this, and this, then you can go to that concert, right? That's what dad said. It's not really a good use of the phrase. Um, logically speaking, what it means is if, if A occurs, then B, and if B occurs, then A, the natural consequences. Now, this is different than their traditional if-then logic statement because it works both ways. So let me give you an example. If Doberman, then dog. Is that true? If it's a Doberman, then it's a dog. The, vice, the, the reversal of that statement is not true if dog then Doberman, right? Because they're clearly dogs that are not Dobermans. So what we have is a conditional so that if I say if A then B, and if B then A. And this is going to be very necessary as we go and solve um, for linear equalities, okay? Just like it was when we solved regular equalities. Same thing for subtractions. A is greater than B if and only if A minus C is greater than B minus C. And if A minus C is greater than B minus C, then A is greater than B. Okay? 
If I'm subtracting the similar amount from both and the equality holds, then if I add it back in, the original quantities will still have this relationship of inequality. Now, these look just exactly like something we did with the qualities also. For all real numbers A, B, and C non-zero. Right? C non-zero and positive. We want to be careful on the positive here. A is greater than B if and only if A, C is greater than B, C. So if I have an inequality, A greater than B, then multiplying both sides by a positive number still keeps the inequality in check. Right? Likewise, if I have two numbers that have a common factor, C, and I have AC greater than BC, and then their underlying inequality is that some number that's not the common factor is greater than another number that's not the common factor. And uh, we'll, we'll use this more and more. It's just like regular qualities, just with a not equal sign, right? Um, divisions. We had something like this for equalities, didn't we? The equality holds true as long as you do the same thing, you know, divide both sides by it. And um, rule number B changes. Uh, rule number B. Right? Have you guys ever seen Home Alone where Buzz is making the argument? He's like, A, 2, and then D. Um, I have a cousin, by the way, that looks like Buzz from Home Alone. Um, he doesn't know this, and he does not know the movie represents this film. Um, for all real numbers A, B, and C negative, right? C negative. Why am I not talking about C zero? What happens if you divide by zero? Pardon? You can't divide by zero, right? If you divide by zero, the universe unravels. Uh, Doc Brown's flux capacitor doesn't work. I mean, the world just breaks. So, um, so don't do it. And it really doesn't break, right? It just it makes no sense to talk about dividing by zero. Right? Because when you talk about division, you're really talking about breaking something into equal parts, right? Into that number of equal parts. How do you take a quantity and break it into no equal parts? You can't do it, right? It makes no sense. Um, so, but A greater than B, if and only if A, C less than B, C. Have you guys seen O Brother or Art Thou? Yeah. There's that line where like, that don't make no sense. You know that line? Yeah. Go watch it tonight. It's like my favorite one. Okay. Um, so A greater than B, if and only if A, C less than B, C. Now this is weird, right? Up here, it said... C greater than zero, A greater than B, if and only if AC greater than BC, right? But down here, if I have a negative C, what does it do to my inequality when I multiply both sides by a negative number? It changes the direction of the inequality. Because what are you doing when you multiply something by a negative? You're flipping it across the zero on the number line, right? So the mirror image, if you've got A less than B, right, when I rotate them about the zero on the number line, all of a sudden now this is greater than this, isn't it? Yeah. And it, all, it, all that negative does is a clear rotation about zero. So just keep in mind that when you multiply anything that's negative, I am flipping it across the zero on the number one, okay? All right, so the same thing happens if I divide by a negative number. If I multiply inequality or divide inequality by a negative number, I change the direction of the sum. Now, I'm laying all these rules out on you to put them out there, okay? It seems like a lot, but we're going to start to use them, and you're going to see why. Any questions on these so far? By the way, this is exactly the same as inequality work, right? The only thing that's different, all these properties, they're the same, right? The only thing that's different is if you divide or multiply by negative, you have to change the direction of the inequality. Okay? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Practice time. <laughs> 
resulting inequality in both set builder and integral notations, then we're going to graph their solutions on a number line. I um, have high expectations, right? So I've got x minus 5 greater than, or less than negative 3. x minus 5 less than negative 3. Out of curiosity, what do I do? If I had this, I mean, and the way we talk about solving this, it's exactly the same way as it was with an equal sign, right? We're going to work to get that x by itself. So if I add something to both sides, it doesn't change the nature of the inequality, right? That's when we went through all those rules. Basically, we were just setting them a lot so you know to be comfortable with them. And we treat it just like it's an equal sum. How do I get x by itself? I have x minus 5, which means I need to do what? Yeah. Add 5. I'm going to add 5 to both sides. So I have x. I no longer have any terms on the left other than x, right? My inequality does not change. Never, ever. x less than negative 3 plus 5 is what? 2. Now, what that rule really said was, if I add something, it doesn't change the nature of the inequality. It really means that these two inequalities are the same inequality, right? They're the same. They're just expressed differently. This is solely in terms of the variable, and this is in terms of the variable less quantity. Same difference. All right, well, I said we were going to define the solution in terms of set builder, interval notation, and then draw the number one. All right, set builder notation. Set builder. What does a set builder notation always have? The curly braces. Okay, hold on just for one second. Let me. Uh, this is section three five of your text, isn't it? <coughs> Speak up, please. Great. Yeah, beautiful. There's like a nice table there, right? So curly braces, and then what do I have for the set builder notation discussion? X, and then the vertical line, right? Such that, that's how we say that vertical line, such that. Such that. Such that. That's it. That's our set rule notation. That's it. Is that a 3 minus? Oh, no, this is a B. This is me saying set builder, right? The handwriting is just visible. Okay, now interval notation. Two parentheses in this case. One. One parenthesis here. What goes? What goes here? Uh, negative, negative, negative infinity, right? Because I've got all the numbers less than two. Comma two. two. Now, do I include two or not? No. 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 So, do I use parentheses or square bracket? Parenthesis. Parenthesis. You probably said that. I just I was trying to elaborate. So, sorry. Okay. But didn't you just say you don't include two? I don't include two, so I use the parenthesis, right? If I had included two, I would have used the square brace. Okay. Right here? That's negative infinity? Okay. All right. Now let's draw this on the number line. So I've got my number line drawn with two, right? Do I go to the right or the left? Right. To the left, right? Right, left, uh-huh. Okay. I'm going from two to negative infinity, right? Negative infinity goes this way. So that means that my line is going this way. Now, do I use an open, open circle? All right. At 2, I use an open circle because I don't include it. 
and then I just head to the, to the left. Now, if you look in the book, just one second, if you look at the book, do you see that they actually, they used parenthesis on the number line and they used square brace on the number line? If you want to do that, I'm cool with it. I don't care. Um, if you want to draw it on top of this, that's fine, but it better be easy for me to see that you're drawing the direction of your graph, right? So sometimes having a pencil number line with your direction drawn in pencil is not always so clear. Okay. So set builder interval detection number line. All three at the same time. What do you think? So we're going to do several more. Where are you not? Same drill. What do I do? I'm going to get x by itself. I subtract 7 from both sides, leaving my inequality with x greater than or equal to 3. Okay. Set builder notation. <laughs> Yeah, the curly braces, which I don't really know how to have a real name. You gotta draw them though, right? Mm -hmm. And then what? And then the line the vertical line. Greater than or equal to five. That's three, right? Yeah. Basically this just goes right here, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. X such that and then whatever I wrote here goes there. Okay. Yeah. Interval notation. Does that mean square bracket? Square bracket. Three, comma, infinity, parenthesis. Because I can never attain infinity, right? But I am including three in this inequality, so I get the square brace. All right, the number line. Pick up now. I've got three. I'm going to the right and left. Three to infinity. Three to positive infinity. To the right. And do I include zero three or not? So I've got a closed in circle. So I have one. The reason I'm doing by drawing on top of the, like above the number line is because I've learned from my own experience that if I try to draw it on top of the number line, it's not so easy for you to see either, okay? So, um, and when it comes time for there to be multiple inequalities drawn on the same number line, which will happen in section 3.6, by the way, um, it gets really hard when you start talking about having multiple inequalities drawn on the same number line on a line piece of paper. This is the only reason I'm doing it. Um, any questions on this stuff so far? Okay. Ma'am. So the bracket is the bracket means it does not include. The bracket means it does it include, include, right? Greater than or equal to means I include the three, right? Any x which is greater than or equal to three satisfies this inequality. <coughs> and so for instance, I want to include three. 3 is a possible option, right? 3 plus 7 is greater than or equal to 10, isn't it? 10 is greater than or equal to 10. Check. That's a true statement. So I want to include 3, hence the square brace, and hence the fill bit circle. So far, so good? Less than nine. What's the trick? What do I do? Divide by three. Leaving me with x less than three, right? Now this is almost exactly similar to our last problem, isn't it? So the set builder notation varies only by the fact that I have x less than three. Oh, John. The interval notation 
varies only by the fact that, so let's go back and look. I had, uh, I got less than, right, as opposed to greater than or equal to. The interval rotation will vary because I'm changing the fact that this is on the right. True? Mm -hmm. Okay, so x less than 3. How do I write my interval notation? Which infinity? Negative, Negative infinity, right? Because I've got all the x's less than 3. So that's to the right, I mean, that's to the left of 3, right? So I've got negative infinity because any number that's less than 3 will satisfy that. Do you believe me on that comment? What's a, no, what's a number less than 3? Pick one. Two. two. Does 3 times 2 satisfy less than 9? Yes. yes. Pick another one. No. 1. Is 3 times 1 less than 9? Yes. What about a negative number? What about negative 5? Is, what's 3 times 5? What's 3 times negative 5? Is negative 15 less than 9? You betcha. So I want to say, I want to grab all the numbers that are less than 3. Would you want to include 3? No. No. So I'll put parenthesis. Just like that. No square brace, parenthesis. So then finally, when it comes time for me to draw this on the number line, Yep, the arrow points to the left with the open hole. Open. So if it's less than, I have the parenthesis and the open circle, right? Okay. Ever. 
never, ever, ever. Do you know, by the way, if all of your classmates are okay? I mean, like. I think when they said she may not be here tonight, the last class period. Well, she was kind of up there in Luthersville later on, too, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, and I know Melissa wasn't going to be here, but uh, uh, Jerry and Latricia in the back. Yeah, she, she stay out in the county, yeah. like, back that way. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Well, if, you, if anybody has a chance to talk to any of them, just make sure they're okay. All right? All right, so lastly, let's draw that number line. Number line time. Right? It doesn't matter where you put the number in the number line, right? Because this is your orientation point. You can put it in the center, you can put it in the left, you can put it in the right. I typically put it, if it's greater than or equal to that number, I'll typically move it to the left, right? Just so that way people can see that we're headed that way more. And if I'm going to negative infinity, I'll typically put it on the right hand side of the number line. So you see that I'm headed left more clearly. Um, but it doesn't matter. You can put it wherever you want to put it dead center if you want, right? It's closed, that's rough. That is correct. <laughs> and it goes to the right. What do we think? Is this going okay so far? All right. Oh, well, let's do some compound ones. I'm going to take that as the huff of happiness. <laughs> okay, we've done several where we've divided and we've done several where we've added, right? So let's do them in tandem. What do I do now to get the x by itself? I'm going to add two. Leaving me with the inequality 8x, last on 14. Do you guys see that the, I do this double arrow, this double line, right arrow thing a lot? I do this because we kind of treat this as a this implies, right? This must be 16. Be 16. <laughs> oh, well, A, I can't add, right? 2, I can't draw. And D, you're a bad teacher. That didn't help me either. Um, my, my, implies, my implies often ends up looking disheveled. So. Um, 8x less than 16. Okay, now what do I do to get x by itself? Now I divide both sides by 8. Implying that x is <coughs> less than 2. Okay, do we need to go through all three again? Or, or is there any one of those three notations that you're having trouble with? Set builder, interval, or number line? This is not a speak now or forever hold your peace discussion, right? The set builder is straight away, right? X such that X less than 2. If you get down to the inequality, you've got the set builder notation. Because you do curly brace, curly brace, X such that, and then recopy. Check. Done. Interval notation. Do I go towards infinity or negative infinity from 2? Negative. negative infinity. So I have negative infinity and 2. I'll never get to negative infinity. Do I include 2? No. No. So I use square brace or a parenthesis. And then finally, the number line. Like, here's a 2. Open circle or closed circle? Open. Open. And there we go. Any questions on this one?
Negative 5 max plus 3. Less than 18. And by the way, can everybody see if there's a negative coefficient on the variable? There's a negative coefficient on the variable? Negative 5? Because we need to practice this dividing by negative thing, right? Okay. What do I do to get x by itself? Subtract a 3, leaving me with the fact that negative 5x is now less than 15. How do I get x by itself? Divide by negative 5. So I have x. What's 15 divided by negative 5? Negative 3. But I just divided by negative. What happens to my inequality sign? It's Right? It goes from this to this. So I went from being greater than uh, this less than 18 to x greater than negative 3. Now, check it. You don't believe it. Pick numbers that are less than negative 3, like negative 5, and plug them into that and see what you get. Say you pick negative, like x less than negative, x greater than negative 3. So say you pick negative 5 and see if that inequality holds true. Negative 5 times negative 5 gives me 25, right? Is 25 plus 3, is it less than 18? Is 28 less than 18? No. However, pick a number greater than negative 3. Any number. What's a good number greater than negative 3? Negative 2. Negative 2. Negative 5 times negative 2 is what? 10. 10 plus 3 is 13. Is 13 less than 18? Yes. You betcha. If you don't believe the rules, pick numbers and check it out, right? That's the way you learn. That's the way you get comfortable with it. Don't just accept it. Play with it and make sure it's right. Okay. Set builder. X such that X is greater than negative 3. Interval notation. What's that interval notation? Parenthesis. Negative three. Negative three. Comma. Infinity. Parenthesis. Because I never get to infinity, can I? It's an idea. It's a direction. It's not a number. And I don't include negative three on the bottom. Pick numbers that are greater than negative 3 and I don't include it. Alright? And number line, same drill. I've got negative 3, open circle, to the right. Is this stuff going okay? I know. Why did you say we looked at it here? Because we divide or multiply by a negative. Okay. And if, and if we ever change the inequality by multiplying through on both sides by a negative or dividing through both sides by a negative, inequality just changes directions. And remember, it's because if you have a less than b, whenever you have a negative involved in the mix, it's a reflection about zero on the number line. And so now a is greater, or negative a is greater than negative b. Will it take practice? Yes. All right. Here's the recommended exercises. Do as many as possible. What's the normal with Tuesday? Test. So, question here. Do you want, yeah, remember we did this. Remember, we, we did the six exams, so that way, no, no one exam can make or break your, your average, right? Um, give you some more time to study in between. It means you had more exams with less content on each exam, but cover it in more detail. So I'm making sure that you know this content, so when you go to college algebra, you know it, right? It'll be 3-4 and 3-5, and uh, in a little bit, we're going to look at some 3-6, and we'll see if you're comfortable with it, okay?
Maybe some folks. What's that? That was why I gave you your test back to rework the other day, remember? That was more than I give in most classes. becomes its own section in this book, but it's only because these authors really like short sections. In most textbooks, I would venture to go as far as say that these are kind of combined in one large inequality section. Um, so it works out well that it's broken up, right? I mean, in, in a class we're trying to cover in-depth discussions, uh, having more than one section is nice because it provides good stopping points. All right. Now, this is one step farther in the difficulty of the inequality, right? So look at number one. Number one, number two, and number three all look like section changes from section three three to section three four, right? We start with a linear a linear equality and we solve it in one section. Then the next section we take it to another step. The same idea occurs here, except it's within inequalities. All right. If this were an inequality, um, if this were an equality. Right? If that said 6x plus 9 equals 2x minus 7, how would you go about solving it? What's the first thing you would try to do? Yeah. Yeah, get x's on one side, right? How do I get the x's on one side? Okay. <coughs> we'll subtract 9. Sure, we'll subtract 9 from both sides, implying that I have 6x greater than 2x minus 16. Thank you. Okay, now I still want to get the x's by themselves. Subtract 2. Subtract 2x. Implying that 4x is greater than or equal to negative 16. We've done this one before already, haven't we? It doesn't work just like this. What do I do? I, did, I had a negative in the inequality, but I did not divide by a negative number, did I? No. So I did not change the direction of my inequality sign, did I? Just because I have a, a negative doesn't mean I change signs on that. All right. Well, now, I said to do all this in set builder and interval notation on the number line. Well, let's just do it with interval notation for now, for the second time, okay? What's the interval notation of x greater or equal to negative 4? We have square bracket. Okay. And you have negative 4. Uh huh. Comma. Comma. Infinity. Infinity. Parenthesis, right? Because infinity is not attainable. It goes on. It goes on and on and on, right? Just like the preacher on Easter Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> that captive audience. <coughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Most preachers actually do a pretty good job of keeping the Easter Sunday one short, right? Because everybody's got a big dinner at home already. And, you know, so, All right. Let's do this one. Notice I only had five slides, right? One of them is always the recommended exercises. 
isn't it? One of those recommended exercises, one of the title slide. I mean, that had two, three, and four is content. It's a short section, isn't it? The other one had nine slides. We had 14 slide shows. Great. All right, let's do this one. Is this one harder than the previous ones? It's the same idea, isn't it? It just looks a little bit more convoluted. What do we do? What's the word? Uh, distribute. These properties hold, don't they? They never change. So if I distribute, what do I get out of this first term? Minus 10 plus 7. Yes, I get the 7 times the 1, right? Mm -hmm. I still have my inequality, and then I have to distribute on the right hand side. 6. Alright. Yeah, you, you really cannot understand how much better your, your work, your arithmetic, and your algebra have gotten throughout the term. Seriously, you cannot understand it unless you're sitting from this side and listening to it. Um, it's just that much more improved. All right. How do I, or what's my goal? Let me ask that question. What's my goal? Combine my like terms. Get them all together. I need to do a little simplification on each side, right, if I can? What do I, what do I have on my left side when I simplify just a little bit more? 9x plus 3. Plus 3? Minus 3, yeah. And I still got 3, less than or equal to 3x minus 6. Okay, what do I do now? Add 3 to both sides. So this implies that I have, I shouldn't have written this implies about that. This implies I have 9x less than or equal to 3x minus 3. And what's left? from both sides, implying that 6x is less than or equal to negative 3. Last step, what is it? Isn't this just like solving those inequal those equalities different section 3, 4? Exactly <coughs> like it. Divide by 6, <coughs> implying that x is less than or equal to negative 1 half. So what does my interval notation look like? So I've got a bracket on the right, negative 1 half, and then where do I head? All the way down to negative infinity, right? That is your set notation. Put your interval notation around it. I gotta tell you, the way I feel like your feedback is working tonight, I kind of wish we'd done evaluation at the end of the class period. You know, um, sometimes just look at those things and like. Oh well. <laughs> so it goes, right? This way I get your more honest feedback, right? <laughs> there are sometimes you just get those evaluations back. And you know, everybody's having a bad day. Maybe it's just a little bit towards the end of the term. I've gotten some back that when I look at the class, I was like, the class was amazing. I mean like like the dynamic in the classroom was wonderful and my evaluations were like I'm going to rip off his arm and beat him with it. And I mean, they were just brutal. And, I, and you, you kind of leave just being a little like, oh, that worked pretty well. You know, like a little bit crushed. You're like, oh, that was pretty good. And uh, then there's some classes, you, you know, you think they're going badly, and you get evaluations back. And, you know, half the class liked you, and you didn't really realize it. And that's, that's like a good feeling, right? I mean, the, the, the evaluation day is this like emotional roller coaster day. Um, when you get those back, you know, a semester later, it is uh, it is a really really um, interesting day. My wife and I will typically sit down and pull out our evaluations and like let each other read them, 
and kind of either console the other or, you know, uh, be like, oh, that's awesome, you know, kind of talk through it so it, like, we have our own cheerleaders. Are you all alike? Uh, yeah, we're pretty similar in a lot of ways. Um, I mean, I'm probably a little bit less easily stressed out than she is, but once upon a time, we were, on that discussion, we were wildly different. And like any two people that have been together a long time, you start to be more alike. So I'm now much more easily agitated. I don't know about what I'm saying. That's what people say. Look alike. Uh, That's what people say. After a while, they tend to look alike. Um, <laughs> she's slightly more curvaceous than I am, you know, by nature of gender. So um, let's let's hope you don't look too much like that. But um, I mean, now I am much. It's much easier. Like when we first started dating, I mean, I was really like, whatever, eh, whatever. And now I'm a little bit more like. No, you know. Oh, okay. And uh, she, she's, uh, she's calmed down a bunch too. And uh, uh, so, in a lot of ways, we're a lot more alike. Uh, we were always pretty similar because uh, we met in the math class. We were both math, computer science majors. Um, the only difference is she spent a lot of time growing up near Chicago, right? And uh, I grew up in the foothills and the hollers of Kentucky. So um, I remember calling her sister when she went out to visit her sister in Colorado one summer. And her sister told her, like, do you understand what he actually just said? <laughs> like, uh, on the message, I was like, hey, this is John. I just call me what you're up to. You know, I'll talk to you later. Have a good afternoon. Later. And I hung up the phone, you know. And uh, she was like, do you understand what he said? <laughs> to, to Stacy. And she was like, yeah, why? You know, because... She's been uh, accustomed to it. But, okay, anyway. <laughs> three eighths in minus one half in greater than two thirds. What do I do? We have to find that Common denominator, right? Yeah. It never goes away. Uh, what's the common denominator? 24. Eight is the least common denominator. Twenty-four. Are you? But we're going for all three of them, correct? Well, you could be. If you, it depends on what you're trying to do, right? If you're just trying to do on the left-hand side, the least common denominator is eight. If you're just if you're trying to do the whole darn thing, then the least common denominator is going to be is going to be it's going to be twenty-four, right? What should we rather do? Just eight. Let's do the 24 one. Let's do it so we keep it consistent with our discussion, right? In the back of my head, I will admit that I would have done these two together as one mm -hmm. and then solved. And then go back and do another one? Uh, well, I mean, I, that's how I would have done it personally, is what I'm saying. But let's do it the other way to keep it consistent with our discussion in the other section. So, at least come with the denominator. I've got two, which is prime, three, which is prime. 8, which is 2 times 2 times 2, right? So the least common denominator looks like the greatest number of each one of the terms. So I've got 1, 2, and in this one I have 3 2's, right? So I get 3 2's. The greatest number of 3's that I have between any one term is 3. So the least common denominator is 24. What do I need to multiply? Three eighths by to get the common denominator of twenty-four. Oh, or rather, let's talk about it this way. Once I find the least common denominator, what do I do to both sides of the inequality? This is what we did in three four, I think. If I find the least common denominator, how do I get rid of the terms of the denominators? Multiply both sides by the least common denominator, right? So I say I'm going to multiply this side by 24, and I'm going to multiply 2 thirds by 24. Okay, what do I get when I multiply 24 by 3 eighths? Now remember the whole point is because my denominator is a divisor of 24, right? So really you just multiply 24 by 3. 
So I, I multiply, I get rid of the 20, 24 and the 8 divided by what? 3. 3. So 24 divided by 8 gives me 3, right? And then I still have this 3n term floating around. I distribute the 24. 24 times 1 half, or 24 divided by 2 is what? 12. And I had still have that minus, so I have 12n. And then that's greater than 24 divided by 3 is what? 8. And I still have that multiple of 2. So I have 9n minus 12n greater than 16. What's 9n minus 12n? 3n greater than 16. Uh-oh. I have a negative that I'm going to divide by, right? So when I divide by negative 3 on both sides, Toyota, you're totally right. It changes directions on the inequality. And like, um, Ashley, like you're fond of asking, do I like it in the improper fraction? I'm totally cool with it, right? Yeah. 16 over negative third, leave, uh, negative over negative three, leave it. Call it quits. Say goodnight. So the whole point of finding the least common denominator was because my term in the denominator of each one, when I multiply through, is a clear divisor of that constant multiple, right? Mm -hmm. So I hold on to 24 divided by 8 gives me 3, right? I hold on to that 3 and whatever I've got left over for my fraction. 24 divided by 2 is 12. I hold on to 12 and whatever I have left over from my fraction, which is 1n. 24 divided by 3 is 8. And I have, I hold on to whatever is left over from my numerator, 8 times 2. Do we need to write it out like that? Because I, I have to have it. Um, you, you know, I, I'm not so bent on you writing it out the way that we do it there. As long as you understand it and you can express, you understand it too. The issue is if you write down something on the paper and then you make some miraculous jump from line 1 to 3, right? I mean, not only if it's a mistake, I can't give you points for it. But if I don't see your work, right, there's, there's this clause in the syllabus that says you may receive little to no credit for an answer with no appropriate work. I mean, if you don't have any work, right, I have to presume one of two things. You're either really good at this content or you could be cheated, right? Does that make sense? <laughs> If there's an answer that just pops up on the page and it's correct, do you see what I'm getting at? There are really two alternatives. Either you did it all in your head and you didn't write it down on the paper, or you got it from somewhere else. In either case, I have to be mindful of that. Well, how many of us would, would claim ourselves to be geniuses in math? All right, she would. Well. And then I can just take your answer. Right? You know, um, but uh, I, I mean, I yeah. Well, I mean, if you don't, if you don't write out as much, right? If you do make a mistake, you can't track it down because your mistake may have come because you accidentally wrote down a sign wrong. And if you do write down more work. I can give you partial credit. <laughs> oh, it's just a big game, isn't it? The cynical view of college is that it's a big game and you've got to play it well. Okay, uh, let's go back. Um, so that was our last example there. Now, here's what I want to start this call. Go ahead. The interval notation? You know, I've forgotten about it. Do you want to do interval notation? What's it look like? In less than negative 16 thirds. Uh huh. That's my own. Negative 16 thirds. Oh, you're totally laughing at my negative infinity. What are you laughing at?
Okay, yes, that's exactly right. So let's go back for a second, and this will conclude, I mean, we're not going to have this stuff on the test for certain, right? But I'll be honest, I feel like this stuff is everything you already know to do with just inequality signs, right? And not equal signs. So I'm going to be pretty honest, and I'm pretty comfortable in saying you should know this for a Tuesday test. Because it's not really a change in what you know. The addition is when you divide by a negative and the notations, right, for the solution ranges. That's the difference. You're picking up that. Now, let's go back to this, and I want to leave you with this idea of what intersection and union means, and then we'll come back on Tuesday before the test, and we'll pick back up here, okay? Intersection means what is common between two sets. Union implies belonging to either set. So when Stacy and I married, we had very different CD collections, right? Now, nobody actually has a CD collection anymore because we don't buy them. We just download the MP3s from Amazon or iTunes. But um, let's talk about this. Intersection. When we both married, we had a Garth Brooks The Hits CD, right? Because everybody has a Garth Brooks The Hits CD. At some point, you probably think you lost your Garth Brooks The Hits CD, and we now bought another one. And so you may even have two or three Garth Brooks The Hits CDs. Well, I think we have three, very literally. So the intersection means what is common between two sets? Did Garth Brooks' greatest hit CD lie in the intersection of our CD collections? Absolutely, right? Now, she is a Broadway musical fan. And although I appreciate them, this was not in my upbringing, right? I was a David Allen Coe, Willie Nelson, those kind of guys. That's what I'm, Johnny Paycheck, you guys know what I'm talking about? Old country, country, country music. Um, I mean, like, redneck country music. Um, we drove around in our loud four-wheel drives on Friday nights in my small hometown, listening to Willie Nelson and Hank Williams Jr., right? Yeah. It's good life. Um, so, uh, and on, if, if, during deer season, we would keep the deer in the back of the truck and drive around and show everybody what we found. It was a good life. Uh, we load shotgun shells on Thursdays and shoot guns on Fridays. Good time. So, union implies belonging to either set. Did I have Broadway musicals in my CD collection? Uh -huh. No, but did my wife? Yeah. Yes. So when I talk about the union of both our CD collections, that's in, those Broadway musicals are in the union of our sets, right? Mm -hmm. um, when you get married, what do you say? On, on thee do I bestow all my earthly goods. You know that talk, that discussion? Uh -huh. <laughs> I was like, no, that's getting eliminated from <coughs> wedding vows. Uh, my sister refused, refused to say obey. Right in her wedding vows, she made she the, the preacher was going through the vows. She's like, no, I will not say that. Anyway, she would tell you that she's funny. Um, so we got married, right? All of our all of our possessions beforehand are now in one big set, right? The set of all of our stuff, the union of our two previous sets. Did we have things in common that we had beforehand? Sure. She had forks. Did I have forks? You bet. They lie in the intersection of our personal belongings. But everything we had comes into the union of our belongings. Okay. Have a great night, everybody.